One of the most important uh, scholars of all time once wrote, if you read people passages from the divine books that are good and clear, they will hear them with great joy. But provide someone with a reading from Leviticus, and at once the listener will gag and push it away as if it, as if it were some bizarre food. He came, after all, to learn how to honor God, to take in teachings that concern justice and piety, but instead he is now hearing about the ritual of burnt sacrifices. Anyone want to make a guess when that was written? Right. About 200, right? That was written, if you go much further back than when this guy named Origen was writing, you're not writing about the Bible, you're writing the Bible, right? If you go far enough back, uh, Christians have been struggling with how to read for a long, long time, right? If you look at the book of Leviticus, though, it's the first book that Jewish children read. It's the first book. I mean, that if, you, if you're a Jewish child and they, it's time to, time to learn to read the Bible, Timmy. What are you going to read today, Dad? We're going to read Leviticus, right? No, that's what it is. And if, if you look at the first five books of the Bible, the most important books for the Jewish faith, 42% of it is Leviticus. And it's covering these like nine months. This is a really short period of span. You have from the beginning till they hit the promised land. That's what the first five books cover. And almost half of it is spent going over the, these rules, the, the Levitic, Leviticus, what, what, it, what it covers. And, and so we're going to read Leviticus. Actually, I must confess, I, I've been studying Leviticus these last two weeks, and I found it fascinating. And uh, by no means is it an easy read, but... Man, it's interesting. There's some things going on there you got to pay attention to get, but there's a lot going on there. And so today I want to give you a few appetizers of what makes Leviticus tasty. It's kind of like seafood. It's a lot of work to get it out, but the tasty bits, really the shellfish specifically. So we're going to read a little bit of Leviticus. First, the name itself. Leviticus. You look at the name Leviticus and it implies it's going to talk about the Levites, the priests, right? And then you go to the first chapter and what does it start talking about? Sacrifices and priests and sacrificing. And anyone here is going to sacrifice a goat anytime soon? Exactly. So you think about Leviticus and say, I could read Leviticus or I could just skip on to the next book. And that's what we do. Who here has ever fallen asleep reading Leviticus? Right? I'll admit it, right? I've just glossed right over it at times. There's a better name for Leviticus. It's the Jewish name, and it's Avayakra, which uh, is translated three words, then God called. And it matters to look at each of those words, then God called. Then, it implies that there's ongoing story, right? And there is an ongoing story. We've had Moses lead the people out of slavery, and they get to Mount Sinai, and they're given the Ten Commandments. And then what happened? Well, then God called. I mean, this is the continuation of a story we've been following along. Then God called, and then God called. This is what God desires for the people to do. This is not focused on the Levites. This is God calling to all uh, of the people. That's how a lot of the chapters of, of this book begins. And then God called. Somehow I hear that uh, God called. What I hear when I read that is, is God calls. He goes, hey, talking to you. Hey. God's calling you, and that, that sort of getting Moses' attention. And so God calls, hey, Moses, got something to tell you. And then, he tell, and then Moses takes what God tells him and, and shares it with the entire people. Right? Again and again, God calls. Again and again, hey, want your attention. And then God that bring, gives a word, and Moses brings it to the people and starts describing this partnership. Right? This is not about the priests. This is about a partnership between the priests and the people. Because you... You are the people who are addressed. Le Leviticus talks about y'all bring your sacrifice, and the priest helps you offer it. Y'all are the one who bake the bread. Y'all are the one who raise the goats. Y'all are the ones who, who bring them up. And then the priest is there to assist in the process of making th this sacrifice. So we start reading about the details of this partnership. The challenge is, is that reading Leviticus is like reading Shakespeare. Anyone here read Shakespeare in high school and get bored out of your mind? Oh, yeah. oh my God, right? But Shakespeare is one of the most important authors of all time. Why is it so boring to read? Because it's not meant to be read. It's meant to be acted, right? If you want to enjoy Shakespeare, what, do you, what should you do? Either act it or watch it. Right? Reading it kind of, oh God, right? It, 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 another way of thinking about this, it's, it's like uh, reading Leviticus is like reading a blueprint. Anyone here ever build a house and you have to look at blueprints? And you're looking at this piece of paper and you're trying to imagine the building? 
Right? It's a bit of a challenge. It's not easy to, to wrap your mind around it. But that's what we're doing with Leviticus. We're reading something where it's like a script or a blueprint. And the content is not in the reading. The content is in the doing. Right? The content is in the doing. And if that seems abstract to you, think about the, the content. If you were going to, to write, a, a li, write the Leviticus, the guide to our worship, I changed up a couple bits of worship today, did you notice? Right? Did it feel a bit different? Right? What does it mean that the pastor does most of the talking? Who's the most important person in the room? Right? But what happens when the pastor doesn't do any of the talking? It changes the emphasis, right? You read the book of Leviticus, the priests never say anything. You read the entire book of Leviticus, it never says, and then the priest should say. That changes your understanding of worship, doesn't it? They're worshiping at the tabernacle later at the temple, and the priests don't talk. So that moves the focus on the people, right? The people are the ones doing the worship. This isn't about the priests, this is about the people, right? And if you think about just... How we put together our worship, the fact that uh, if you put the sermon at the end, you put the sermon in the middle, it changes the emphasis. Like, are we building towards some great piece of elegance, sort of eloquence by Andy? No, the first sermon is at the beginning and it prepares you to respond because your response is more important than what I say. Right? I'm up here, I'm, I might just be talking. What I say is secondary to what you do next. Right? So how we put together our worship, that we sit in pews, that we don't sit in a circle, we don't sit in chairs, right? all of these things have a content to them. They matter. Right? I'm not getting up there today because if you put a, a pastor up here, what does that tell you about the role of the pastor? Uh, elevated. If I was going to design my blueprint for my perfect church, I wouldn't be elevated. I'd be down here beneath you. Right? The pastor is the first servant, so the pastor should be lower. Hard to serve if you're elevated, right? And that's what we see with the priests. The priests stand on the same level as the rest of the people who are worshiping. And, and so with this sort of understanding in mind that th this is a script, this is a blueprint, and the content of what you do, that, that's where the content of Leviticus is, I want us to first imagine what Leviticus, what it's describing, what that looked like, and then we'll get into the, a few details. So first, I need you to imagine the biggest circus tent you've ever been in. Huge circus tent. And then double it. And then knock the roof off. That is what the tabernacle is like. They have this huge open area that's bounded by walls of cloth, purple cloth, and in the center, or actually on, one set, on the center on one side is the Holy of Holies, a small tent. And in this big, huge area, what do you smell? Let's talk about smell first, because that's the first thing you notice you walk in the room, you smell. What do you, if there are that many animals being sacrificed, what are you going to smell? Ew. All right? That all that blood, all that meat, that's, that's going to have a smell to it, isn't it? Right? And then, then when you offer this animal, it is turned to smoke. It says a burn sacrifice. They talk about burning sacrifices on fire. The verb they use there is not burn. It's turned to smoke. Anyone here ever forget a steak? Right? You forget a steak and it goes from medium rare to done, to well done. No, this is far past that. We're turning that sucker to smoke, right? What does it smell like when you have forgotten a piece of meat for so long that that sucker is well on its way to just crumbling and falling apart? What's that smell like? Blah! Right? So that's what you're smelling. You have walked into a huge space. A lot of people, people have a smell too when you have that many people together. And you are smelling blood and you are smelling smoke. And, and what are you hearing? Well, no one much is talking. Priests aren't talking. No loud systems, no microphones, anything like that. And so what you're hearing are the animals bleeding. And that's, that's really what you're hearing. And what do you see? Let's say you get there during the middle of the day. There's an order to the, the, the sacrifices that are made. The first sacrifices that are made are the sacrifices of yippee, right? Thank God. It's the peace offerings, the joy offerings. It's the, man, I had a great harvest offering. You make those offerings at the beginning of the day. And then you take those offerings and you share the meal. You, you, take, you, you take an animal, you, you, you burn some of it, turn smoke, and then you eat the rest with the priests, with the other people who are there. And so the first part of the day, They've had a good meal, fresh meat, they had some good time with some friends, they are thankful, they're in a good mood, and they're on their way home now. You're there in the middle of the day, we're transitioning to what happens later. And what happens later is the sacrifices for the, oh man, I, d I done did it again. <laughs> right? There are two of them. There's the purification and there's reparation. Purification is, I, 
you did it, you didn't realize it till later, you didn't mean wrong, but you still did it, so you gotta show up and get right. And the second offering, the reparation is, I did it, I meant to do it, <sighs> right? So people who are showing up, what do they look like? And they're all kind of hang dog because they know they've messed up badly. That's what we're seeing there. And you see the priests, what the priests look like. Like Aaron and his, he has that big old highfalutin ephod, which is a big plate with the 12 stones of each, and he has a big old thing. You can go read the dude looks kind of weird. Uh, that's the long and short of it. But uh, the priests, they're just kind of dudes. They're, they're just there. And so that's, uh, you see them running around. And so that's what you see. And uh, what do you touch? What are you holding? You're holding on to an animal, one of your finest from your herd, and you're holding a knife because you're going to be the one to use that knife, right? And so have that in your mind, this big like circus tent, huge area, the smells, the sights, the sounds. Let's get into some of the details. Notice there are no secrets here. Right? In so many of the religions of that day, there are, in even some religions today, uh, there are secrets, right? You, there are secrets, you have to get sort of a higher level to get told certain secrets. There are no secrets in this tent. Right? You are there and everything the priests are going to do, you read too. Because God called, hey, God gave the directions, you read your part, priests read their part, everyone knows their, their part. There are no secrets here. It's something, if you're, so if you're going to compare it to... Uh, the priests to anyone, they're more like plumbers than doctors, right? Plumbers, what, when you talk to a plumber, the pro problem you're talking to a plumber is usually I want to get water from A to B, or I don't want to get water from A to B. That's it, right? There really aren't that many problems beyond that when it comes to plumbing. And how, You ever talk to a plumber and you find yourself really confused by terminology? No, right? I've never, I mean, maybe there is some lingo that I don't know, but it's all pretty straight tubes, right? Tubes and water. Right? They're, not, they're more like plumbers than doctors. You ever talk to a doctor and you're confused? Right? When haven't you talked to a doctor and end up confused at some point? The, the whole medical field is predicated on, on all this specific language, right? And, and you don't know the language. And, and so it's sort of mysterious. And priests, and this, they're more like plumbers than, than doctors. So you, you know exactly what's going on. And you notice the order of the sacrifices too, right? The worship starts with joy. We're not going to get together and start out by being all hangdog. We're going to get together because we're excited. God has given us an amazing harvest. God has given us a great gift of a child. God has given us something beautiful and it's time to say thank you. That's what comes first. That's what's the most important thing that's going to happen that day. Then later you, you deal with the sin, the things you have to do. Notice that... Uh, if you look around, what you would notice, so you're, you're kind of standing in something approximating a line because you're there to deal with the sin and um, in this sort of imagined understanding. And you look around and you notice something. If a priest is there because a priest is messed up, a priest offers a bull. How much does a bull cost? Stan, how much would it cost me to buy a bull tomorrow? Great bull. Best, you offer the finest, you go to God. What, how would it... Oh, 50,000, right? Fine bull, right? It's gonna, that's an expensive mistake, isn't it? You're offering a fine bull. Oh, I didn't know they were that high. <laughs> that is an expensive mistake. Because when a priest sins, a priest can lead the whole people astray. Right? So a, the next, a community sins. The leaders of a, of a community are, are coming to offer, and they have sinned. Do you know what they offer? They offer a bull. That's another expensive mistake, but a whole community has gone astray. If you sin... If, I, if, if, if you sin, what do you bring? You bring a goat, right? Because a goat, you know, it's not cheap, but it's something of significance, right? You messed up, you forgot Valentine's Day, you bring a goat. You didn't mean to, but you forgot and it's caused big problems, you're bringing a goat. What if the king forgets Valentine's Day and the queen? Ugh, it's bad. What's the king bring? If the king has messed up badly, what does the king bring? A goat. Isn't that interesting? Right? A priest, a priest sins, bull. A people sin, bull. I sin, right? Like a regular person, goat. King sins, goat. Right? Isn't that an amazing statement about like value. I mean, in a time when kings are claiming to be gods and sons of gods, here is the Hebrew people who are saying, you know what, king, if you screw up, that's a shame. Bring a goat just like everyone else. Details. Right? They matter. They matter. It's easy to gloss over those details. You gloss over them because your eyes glaze over. 
But they start to describe something. There's a content here, right? Worship is first about joy. There are no secrets. Kings are on the same level as everyone. These details, they have formed us even to this day. And we don't get together, and we don't like, when we're excited and there's a joyful event, we don't get together and sacrifice a goat and then have a meal together as a church, but sounds like a carrion meal. Right? We still do that. Good day, let's have a carrion, yes! Right? We still do that. We don't give sacrifices according to status. Everyone gets the same plate. Right? No one here gets a special plate for their offering. We still pray, all right? We still pray. We don't pray often using uh, burning things and letting the aroma rise as a sacrifice pleasing to God, but you might later today. I'll tell you more about that later. There's a detail I want us to end with, something that seems helpful to us as we begin this season of Lent, the time when we're preparing for Easter. We, begin, we mark the beginning of Lent by, by marking ourselves with ashes, Ash Wednesday. Palms, the sign of joy, have been turned to ash. We meant well, the crowd meant well, but it just didn't work out. But the two offerings to deal with sin, one of them I told you about, you, you, you did it, you know you did it, that's the reparation offering. The other one is what we're going to look at, the purification offering. That's the, I did it, I didn't realize I did it, I only realized it later, but then I realized I did it. Right? That's the one where you got to focus on, you have nothing to confess because you didn't mean to mess it up, but the damage is done, and once you've done it, once you realize it, you got to do something about it. And, and I, it's, I made, this detail, I think, is interesting because God is taking seriously that when we mess up, even when we didn't mean to mess up, there's still harm done. We still need to get right. And I believe that happens to us. How many times do you have, find yourself saying, well, I meant well? Right? How often do you say that? Well, I tried to do, I tried to do it well, but ugh, that didn't work out so well. Right? It didn't go well. I think that happens to us. I, I know it happens to me. I preached a sermon once. I had a great point. I still believe in this point. The point was simple. Let people not be perfect. I stand by that point. I gave some examples of how people aren't perfect. I used some examples. I, I got in, at one point I said, yeah, you know, people aren't going to use the same language that you might approve of. They might be a little bit more crass in their language. And so I said something crass to make a point. I learned an important lesson there. I don't have to tell you that I said, tell you what I said in the pulpit. I can tell you it was crass. It wasn't, I didn't start swearing. It was just crass, right? And so, but now I learned the important lesson. I don't say something crass. I just tell you and you fill in the blank, didn't you? Because now you can imagine me saying something crass. I said it and learned an important lesson. Didn't mean badly. I meant well. I was just trying to make a point. But whoo, baby. That Monday, phones started ringing. To the, when I, at the church I was at, I would get calls that there was a problem on my landline. And uh, it took me a while to be able to hear the landline ring at the parsonage without wincing. Because I thought I was about to get it again. Because that, that, it was bad. And so I, it, it, what do I do? Do I say, you know what, I meant well. I didn't try to offend everyone, but I did. So, so what do you do? You just move on, pretend nothing happened? No, you gotta go and you gotta drink coffee. You gotta talk about it. You gotta listen. You gotta apologize. You gotta understand, right? You gotta make some sacrifices because something went, you didn't mean to mess it up, but you did. You gotta go and try to heal what is broken. And so at the beginning of, of Lent, I invite you to take on something like that during Lent. During this season of Lent, I invite you to look around at your life and, and look at the ways in which you mean well. We all mean well, right? We mean well. No one gets up in the morning and says, I really would love to sin. I'd really like to, like to whiff today. But uh, take what you uh, have been thinking you, you mean well, and it keeps on going badly. And maybe that's something to work on this, this Lent. I invite you to take what you mean well and write it down. This is what I mean well. I've written down in here. Let me know what's written down in here. I'm not telling any of the other ones of you all because, frankly, it's embarrassing and it's very personal. And I just, I mean well and I try to do right. And I, <sighs> it just doesn't work again and again and again. So I write down what you mean well. And go outside, take a nice deep breath of that cold air, and burn it. Right? Let it rise to God as a pleasing aroma. Your prayer that during this Lent, you're going to take what you mean well, and you're going to try to make it right, and you're going to try to, to do well. Heal what is broken, and instead of just meaning well, do well. Let that be our focus in the days between now and Easter, our sacrifice to make right what is broken, to not cause more, to, more harm, not just to mean well, but to do well. Amen.